Okay, I'm going to launch the YouTube. That is on. And now I will open up the webinar and we're live. Welcome friends. We're gonna get started in just a moment. Hello everyone. Welcome. We'll give it one more minute to fill up the room. Hello, hello. And welcome YouTube viewers. Right. Welcome everyone. Hello. Welcome to the virtual library. I'm putting a link in the chat box for today's doc. And this has library news as well as links to our presenters and any resources that come up i'll add those to it as well all right let's jump in and get started welcome to today's event this is part of our women's history month which the library calls her story and we're so excited today to have dr seema yasmin and zara norbash for a conversation about dr seema's book Muslim Women Are Everything. You can get this book at the library, at your favorite local bookstore. You could probably order it from something called Starts With an A, but we don't like to promote that one as much. Shop local. Check it out at your library. You can get it instantly at the library too, as well as the audiobook. All right. And as I said, this is part of Women's Her Story Month. We will be having events all month long as well as promoting lots of good stuff to read and watch all about women. And we do want to acknowledge that we are occupying the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramutish Ohlone tribal people. And we acknowledge that they are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramyatush community. And I'm going to throw a link into a, the chat box right now that has a reading list about First Peoples, Ohlone land, land rights in general, and great places that you could donate to, including the Segorite Land Trust, which is based in Oakland, and they have a thing called the Shumi Tax, which you can uh donate pay your tax to the land that you're inhabiting so check them out they're amazing all women run organization as well someday we'll get them they're very busy i have tried many times all right and san francisco public library invites you to read post-colonial love poem by natalie diaz this is our on the same page author for march and april on the same page is our reading campaign that's been going on for 17 years. Can you believe that? So Natalie Diaz, amazing poet. She'll be in convo with Michelle Cruz Gonzalez, who is an educator, author, and ex-punk rock drummer. And this book is available at any library you walk in today in San Francisco. You can pick it up on the shelf right now. And now I'm just going to breeze through some other events we have coming up, a small business spotlight with um, the owner of Papa Lama, and we'll be doing a craft. That's Monday. We partner with NPS, the National Park Service, our soul mates of the natural world. We'll be doing a film and panel discussion. And then we have Yasmin Darsnik, who will be talking about her book, The Bohemians. And of course, we can never do any of this without our friends at the San Francisco Public Library who help sponsor, and I see right there we're on that slide, we're, we're sponsoring more than a month, but it is her story. And they did sponsor more than a month too. They helped us with all of our programs. So thank you, friends of the San Francisco Public Library. All right, and now I wanna to introduce today's panelists. 
Um, Dr. Seema Yasmin and Zara Norbesh, uh, we're here to talk about Dr. Seema Yasmin's book, One of Many, Muslim Women Are Everything. A beautiful book, beautiful illustrations, and um, amazing writing to it as well. I, I read the book and listened to the audio. They're both great. Get it today. Hello, Ocean View. All right, so let me do an introduction. Um, I'm going to condense Dr. Seema Yasmin's insanely amazing, brilliant bio. So here we go. Don't make that face because it's true. <laughs> Dr. Seema Yasmin is Emmy Award winning journalist, medical doctor, professor, and author, the director of Stanford Health Communications Initiative, clinical assistant, professor in Stanford University Department of Medicine, and visiting professor at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA, where she teaches crisis management and communications. She was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Breaking News in 2017. Um, she is the recipient of two awards from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, and her reporting has appeared in the New York Times, Wired, Scientific America, and others. Uh, she's a fellow at the Kundiman and Ten House Writing Workshops. Her poems, short stories have been published in literary magazines and anthologies. And her scholarly work focuses on the spread of health misinformation and disinformation, which means she's been very busy the last two years. Uh, the growth of medical and news uh, deserts, news deserts, new, a new term that we've all learned again this year, this last two years, and the impact on public health. And she teaches creative and nonfiction and global health storytelling. So yeah, it's amazing. Zara Norbash is a feminist Muslim, Iranian American comedian and cohort of the award-winning podcast, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim. The podcast was listed as the must listen by Oprah Magazine and was invite and she was invited to the Obama White House to record an episode. Norbash is a uh, senior fellow on comedy for social change with the Pop Culture Collaborative. In addition to her two sold out performances and her stand up comedy special on behalf of all Muslims at the Golden Gate Theater in San Francisco, her solo performance, All Atheists Are Muslim, a Romantic County, was originally directed by CNN's and Bay Area, W. Camus Bell. All right, and without further ado, I want to bring on our two amazing panelists. I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for that overly generous introduction. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Seema. Hello. Uh, can I just call you Doc Seema the rest of the time? I just really. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Takes me back to back to the future fandom. Oh, you're Doc Seema. <laughs> Coming in, yeah, fixing misinformation. Yeah, really good Iranian <laughs> messaging in that movie. Yeah, okay. So I kind of want to dive in and talk about the book and expand out mm -hmm. into the world and from there, the universe. Okay, that sounds okay. like a really doable scope in four, five <laughs> minutes. All right, let's yeah. do it. I've actually, you yeah. know, I've been thinking a lot about you the last week as really tragic world events have been unfolding been okay but I was thinking there's another stand-up comedian whose what? name also begins with the same letter that your name begins what? with and he is becoming a war hero and trying to lead his country out of an invasion but you know President Zelensky started off as a stand-up comedian and I was wondering if your parents had been saying anything recently about your career decisions yeah out I did not know that he started out as a stand-up comedian that's oh, phenomenal yes that's how he started off and I think in fact he played a comedian in a tv show who ends up becoming president of a country if I remember correctly so what's happening now is really life imitating art it's, it's wow a lot. it's a lot yeah that's a lot 
And I mean, not to, put, not to put more pressure on you or anything, but like, I remember when I, was, <laughs> when I was researching your life story to put in this book, Zara, I was coming up against all these interviews you had given where you were giving, they were really actually lovely, endearing, um, reminiscencing, if you like, of your dad um, oh, and yeah. the way that he would talk about, you know, your life choices or your academic achievements. So tell us about that. Yeah, and you know, I don't think he ever banked on, you know, me becoming a president that shepherds folks through a World War Three. He might be now. But yeah, now, but I don't know if you had this growing up too, where like your parents would see something close to something you're doing and be like, oh, you can do that. Oh no, mine was completely anti-aspirational. My, really? Yeah, yeah. My dad was like, she better be a housewife and have loads of kids by the time she's 19, which is my what my mum's life was. Dang. And um, yeah, and my mum was like, I have to get you out of this hellhole. Uh, we will escape. But also she would always remind me, she was like, never ever think that you are gonna have an easy young lady. So, so my wow. mom was completely like, the, the world is not your oyster. She was like, the world is going to be really difficult for you. Um, you're going to have to work 10 times as hard to go one tenth of the way compared to men, compared to non-brown people. And she, it was actually a really good setup for somebody who wanted to become an author. Because this industry, like seriously, and actually that's the kind of backstory behind Muslim Women Are Everything, is myself and Fahmida, the way that this book started out was a tweet it I was like right I was pissed off um, right I, I sent off a rant on Twitter and I was pissed off about like corporations mm. and certain celebrities whatever like purporting to celebrate Muslim women um, yeah this is a few years ago we had a, a, amazing Olympians who were competing in hijab we had like boxers yes it was just amazing and people were like oh oh my gosh, they're amazing and they're Muslim. And I was like, what the heck do you think we are? And so in frustration, right, I sent off this tweet and then got interest from a publisher. Well, at first it became a newspaper article that was very tongue in cheek. And then where it really got difficult is as we started to turn it into a book, there were all these publishers that were kind of like fake interested, wanted to be interested. But then we heard things like, well, there's already a book about. See, this is, yeah, exactly. There's already, this is what I wanted to talk about too. It's like, I feel like a lot of times these conversations about role models pre-existing in the world, tropes that we're up against, stereotypes we're up against, news that we're up against, you know, and then each other's competition that we get pinned up against as tokens yeah, exactly. always get sort of talked about in these kind of like little bubble buckets. But I feel like kind of in a lot of the same trajectory that you talked about is how Taz Ahmed and I found our way to the Good Muslim, Bad Muslim podcast it was like a tweet and conversations we were already having and things we were already frustrated by in our everyday lives. And I, I'm always curious, like, especially me right now, I'm working on my memoir um, and thinking a lot about the human beings that my parents were and kind of what it was like for them to, to sort of role model and kind of set up a path for me or name a path and the pressure of that, that pressure of being that parent. And I, it's so interesting to hear that your mom just like laid it down. And her friends were horrified because they were like, oh, what kind of parenting is that? You're supposed to uplift your child. You're supposed to make them feel like they can be whatever they want. My mom was like, no, she's a little girl. She needs to know how hard it's going to be. And I, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm a very optimistic person. So I probably do some of that positive self-talk myself. It was really helpful to have a mom who was like, I'm just telling you, it's going to be really, really hard. It's going to be frustrating and it's true like bringing it back to book publishing the way that we get deals as authors is through a process known as comping where you put your proposal out your agent sends your manuscript out right the publishers might love it but they're making financial decisions so they are comping it next to oh what else has been written by an Iranian American stand-up comic who's Muslim but she eats bacon I'm talking about you people <laughs> 
what other memoirs do we have like this? You basically need something similar to what you are writing to have sold well in the past for Mm -hmm. someone to be brave, I say that ironically, enough to give you a deal. And in our case, Mm Fahmida and I were like so pioneering. No one had done the kind of book that we had created that it was like, oh, we don't know if it will sell. And it was like, no, but that's the whole point. It's not out there. And for anyone who wants a data on this, because I'm I'm a nerd, obviously, there's a great essay in the Los Angeles Review of Books called Comping White. And it was actually written by a Stanford professor who took all these data, all these figures about publishing to show how you're screwed if you're not white, because the comparisons about what you are writing and how it might sell are made against authors that are nothing like you. And it's so hard when you are the pioneering one trying to create a book that doesn't exist you're basically penalized for it the industry is is a mess well it seems like no matter what it's a lot of what your mom foreshadowed for you (laughs) you're penalized because you know um if you have uh as a manuscript something that is does exist in the world then they say well we already have that so why do we need you yeah and then right if you don't one of us right so you have exactly And then if you don't, then you're in the trap of, you know, well, we're not sure if we're ready for this innovating. Right. It's like, oh, we already have one memoir by a Muslim woman that came out in the 2010s, like give it another decade or we might be ready for another one. So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And therefore what you need is a really good team. You need a really good agent. I'm rep by Lily Garamani. Mm. Amazing. And you need to have a ton of self-belief and persistence and people like you in your life because you've become a friend of mine and I have called you up and said hey I'm working on I'll just call it project x right I remember this conversation I was in bed I remember it very vividly this was like (laughs) last summer and I was like I'm working on project x I've been trying to work on it for about six years. It's not happening. Is this a sign from the universe that I need to be smart and move on to something else? And you were like, no, no, (laughs) you have to keep going. But sometimes you need those pep talks because it's it's a lot of no's. Yeah, say more about your team because I think sometimes folks don't realize, like they think that because it's hard, it must mean that it's not meant to be. You're not following the secret. You know, it's not your path. (laughs) You know, and I don't think, um, there is an answer in our lives to ascension and infiltrating spaces that isn't hard. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of built that way. That's oh, what the man. hegemony is. It's like how yeah. many B12 shots and vitamin supplements do you need to take <laughs> to like counter that fatigue? It's a lot. And I'm getting mine on Monday. Monday oh. is my B12 shot. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually not an advocate for them. So I don't know why I said that, but it's kind of like a bit rude. But I do empty the mineral, sa- vitamins, mineral sachet into my cup, but I don't know about B12 shots. I was just saying that because it sounded cool, but it's a lot of no. So yes, you have I already to- wrote it in my brain as <laughs> advice from I, I Doc tell, Sima. But I tell my students here in the future. Well. I tell my students this, that writing comes off as this like really solitary activity it's like mm-hmm. you're a writer you go away to a cabin and actually we do do a little bit of that but you need to have community because otherwise you will just yes be down so I have an agent I have a tv agent a lit agent and a manager and then to me community obviously expands far beyond that because I have people like you that I can call and say hey I'm a smart person I've been getting rejections on a particular project for six or seven years that's a sign that I should quit that and work it. And you're like, no, no, no. So yeah, sometimes that's, sometimes that's a hard thing to hear. Right. Is like, no, don't quit. No, it wasn't actually (laughs) what I needed to hear. It was perfect. It it resonated. It felt right. But there's a part of me that's like very logical and data driven. So it's like, doesn't six or seven years worth of rejection mean quit while you're ahead, like funnel your energies into something else. And so I needed to hear that, but what, does your community look like? How do you keep my community? community? Yeah, it looks like you. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think you and I have had those talks with my comedy special in post-production. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And yeah, and it, it looks like, um, you know, groups and um, other sub communities, you know, like, um, because I'm, you and I, something we have in common is we're multifaceted folks. Um, and so 
I write, I also perform. Um, and so I make sure that I have a lot of community support in, in all of the niche works that I do so that I have like a comedy community. I have multiple writing communities like Vona, the San Francisco Writers Grotto, the Lit Quake community, the SF Public Library community of folks, um, the my Bay Area fan base that, you know, I came up in the scene with. Um, the Like I, my mentor, W. Kamau Bell, like I, I uh, who I text often for <laughs> advice. Yeah, we need that. Yeah, it, it. I can't tell you how many times I've been also so grateful that I teach because just seeing, you know, my students working on stuff that I'm wrestling with in that moment and hearing my own advice out <laughs> of my own mouth to yeah. them, you know, yeah. and being reminded of it, like, oh yeah, that's right. It goes like this, you know. Um, I feel like we forget that we have to do this hustle as a regular part of the business and you break through in, you know, some rungs and you, you gain some, um, the, I feel like sometimes as a, a brown woman, I'm gaining respect, you know, it's not a baseline. Like I have to earn trust. I have to earn, you know, um, my reputation as a colleague. Um, and then, sometimes with in conversations with myself, I'm earning my own self-care. You know what I mean? Like there's constant vetting that's exhausting. And so I'm always the, anybody who knows me knows that I'm always reaching out and building recruiting community, because I think we need a lot of folks. You need a lot of support. We do. So where are things at with your next comedy special? I'm still working on post-production for okay. this one. And I've started uh, building my next comedy special from stuff that I cut in my previous comedy special to kind of like build out and build out and sort of like collect material. Um, and some of it, it's funny, you think that it it's no longer fresh, right? That like, oh, you. yeah, aren't we past this now? And it's like, no, actually it's, <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, worse yeah yeah and so I wanted to ask you like in the misinformation train <laughs> are, are there things that because like watching the Muslim misinformation train like the Islamophobia machine was big it was a 206 mm -hmm. million dollar fear industrial campaign that was actually proven <laughs> yeah. you know it was a whole expose and so I was curious because like when I saw the COVID misinformation campaign I was like how is this bigger this feel <laughs> yeah I mean and it's all it's all connected in so many ways and mm. the same underlying fears are often used to fuel disinformation campaigns that seem to be about quite different content areas so whether wow. it's uh, fomenting more xenophobia or nationalism or Islamophobia or or whatever that might be, it's interesting that whether you, because one of the things I track is anti-vax and anti-mask sentiments and have been doing so for the last decade, right? And of course, some of it is very, what you might consider like content specific. It will be lies that say vaccines are toxic or uh, vaccines contain microchips, for example, right? And that you can very much debunk on like a scientific level. But increasingly, what you see is this messaging that will say vaccines and masks are anti-American, they're anti-freedom, they go against the American way of life. Therefore, if you get vaccinated or you wear a mask, you are opposing all that this country stands for. And so that's not necessarily about a piece of cloth or about a particular medicine, right? It's about these underlying issues that far predate COVID in particular, like I said, I've been tracking them for about a decade now, more than a decade, actually, because I first moved to this country in 2011, 2010, to serve as an officer in the epidemic intelligence service. My job was uh, responding to epidemics. And I thought, Zara, oh, it's going to be such a sexy job. I got the job the same time that Kate Winslet's movie Contagion came out, where she plays that exact role an officer in the epidemic and oh, that's fantastic level, right and I mean she doesn't have a good ending but I was like oh, I'll be fine I'll be fine I was like 29 and very like you know felt very resilient and like nothing could touch me 
And I was like, oh, there's going to be like so many random outbreaks. And there were, there were weird and mm-hmm. wonderful, bizarre epidemics. There was an outbreak of paralysis in a, ma- a men's maximum security prison that I had wow. to investigate. There were outbreaks of weird things in weird places. But mostly what I was dealing with were outbreaks of like whooping cough and measles and infections that I actually had not seen as a doctor in England because we had vaccines. And yet they were killing American kids. American kids were dying of whooping cough. That was like such anathema to me. Um, Where we have the vaccine access. And yet, except we have also the circulating sentiments that you can't trust the government, which actually for many Americans might be quite a legitimate sentiment based on history (laughs) in in modern day, you know. Um, So, yeah, and I think I saw saw somebody in the chat saying like, wow, I don't know if they were being sarcastic, but some people do ask me seriously that do anti-mask sentiments predate COVID. And actually there's a talk I give where I start off the talk by saying, imagine this scene, it's from real life. There are these people, they're holding a town hall in San Francisco near the pier. And they're talking about how evil and how anti-freedom masks are, right? So this group has got together that they're the anti-mask coalition. And I'm like, and by the way, the year is 1918 because wow. this ain't no it's been no. happening for like over a century and and until we deal with the sometimes mm. legitimate reasons for which people don't trust the government um and and of course many other issues too unless we deal with that underlying stuff we're not going to convince people to wear masks and get vaccinated and, and trust in the scientific process so but again that all right. links to the fact that um the underlying reasons aren't always about the vaccine itself it's so much to do with everything that's around it some of what you do so well is explore framing and so much of the book's gorgeousness was in how everyone's stories were framed and how they were being featured you know and i was curious like in your sort of curation of that and as you think about how you want to frame the narrative what are your strategies around that how, how do you approach it? Because I know there's a lot of talk right now about framing our stories around resilience. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, how do we celebrate that resilience and not talk about where it's coming from, you know, and visualize that and acknowledge that. And it always feels like this tension of opposing forces of highlighting my joy, but then folks want to hear about the tragedy. How do you navigate that? I think it's like, it's what Chimamanda reminds us about when she says there's the danger of telling that single story, right? Mm. So for me, this book was about blowing that up, although maybe I shouldn't make any jokes about blowing things up, um, given we are two Muslims. Definitely do. (laughs) But if there's one thing we get from that stereotype, it's the jokes. The jokes (laughs) get to be ours to make. And even if they're not good jokes and we bomb, right? Right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so part part of it just came from my frustratedness as Mm. someone who saw myself, my faith, my community, my sisters misrepresented or represented in a very like, this is how we want Muslim women to appear. And this book, I remind people, it is blowing up that sentiment of Muslims or Muslim women as a monolith because there are women in there that would probably hate each other. There are women in there who are complete (laughs) pacifists, you know? And then there are women Mm. in there who are Muslim women who are military strategists, who were all about rolling up their sleeves, mounting a horse, wielding a sword and being like, yeah, let's go to war. So we don't all like each other. We don't all agree with each other. We don't even all agree on what Islam looks like or should look like or how it should be practiced. I mean, there's people that drink and then there's, in the book I talk about Generation M and this whole rise of like halal liquor or like, you know, like no alcohol, but we want to drink cocktails. So, I mean, there's just multitudes, right? And so for me, framing this was almost like moving the frame and then breaking the frame and then rebuilding the frame somewhere else and kind of reminding people that you've had narratives, but this book is jam packed full of counter narratives. And when you thought about the artwork, it's something that strikes me so much about the book is it's gorgeous artwork yeah. by Fahmida yeah. Azim. It, it just pops. It's just so bright and colorful. 
It Take is. a look, folks. It's gorgeous. And for, for me and Fahmida, we were looking at these really depressing stats. Oh, look who's here. This is you. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were looking at these really depressing stats of how few Americans say they know a Muslim, um, how few have met one in real life or think they know what one looks like. And so we were like, yeah, this can't just be a book of words. This needs to be really visual. And even thinking about the cover, um, like you can see it doesn't have a single woman on it, but initially we wanted one particular image or it was like bounced around that one particular woman's face would be on it. She happened to be light-skinned. She happened to wear a hijab. And we were like, nah, we can't do that on the front of this book because we don't all look like that. Some of us look like this. Right. Like Dr. Abdul Khabir. And then others look like this chick who likes taking, you know, saucy pictures. Like, so we didn't want to put just one image on the cover again to break this idea that we all look the same or dress the same um and also again with this in mind that a lot of Americans say they don't know a Muslim and so bam you have in your face a scuba diving hijabi midwife from Singapore and wow. then, then you have a weightlifter from the UAE like you know look at that we can take wow. that but how do you broach this in your comedy well you know I try to think about comedy as always being a celebration that that's what a punchline is that's how i define a punchline a punchline is a celebration and it it's not really about the laugh like thinking about it as being about the laugh is kind of like when actors play an emotion you know it's the thing that it's the laugh is the byproduct of the work that you do mm. and there's there's been this you know kind of running conversation about whether or not Hannah Gatsby's um, piece Nanette was a stand-up special, or if it was like Ted talk, or if it was, you know, something else, a one person show, therefore not a stand-up special. Um, and my philosophy on that is always number one, the artist decides that's up to the artist. And but they said, yeah, you can't decide how it's perceived though. And that's a separate thing. I think yeah. for us as audience, our job is to relate to a piece and to have conversation about the piece and about how it landed on us. Um, and our relationship to what the artist has called it, you know, and how we relate to that. I don't think it's our position to take it from the artist and say, no, you know, and, and especially take it from a major Hollywood distributor and say, yeah. we disagree, you know, I think, and, and I'm not going to say never, but in this case, Hannah Gatsby's um, performance was such a classic example of stand-up comedy stand-up comedy in its storytelling is very much stylized or structured like a personal essay. Okay. And it, it doesn't really care about loose threads or um, not loose threads of story. You mm -hmm. know, it doesn't care so much about its A plot and B plot and C plot. It mm -hmm. cares about its central argument and how hard you land it. Yeah. And at the end of Gatsby's piece, theirs was a celebration of leaving the audience with the discomfort and emotional labor that they'd been carrying. And what a triumph, what a mic drop. Yeah. And they just landed in our laps and they get to walk off the stage a little bit lighter, you know, <laughs> and that's a form of celebration. And so I always say the way to guide ourselves towards what is that punchline is to lead by celebration. What are we celebrating? I, there was a clip um, that I watched of you when I took one of your comedy writing classes, which I recommend everyone take. Because interestingly, maybe this isn't that much of a shocker, but I found so much of what you taught to be applicable to writing across other genres. Mm. And I found it really helpful in just crafting nonfiction and journalistic work too. But you know, you, you made us watch so many clips of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those clips was brilliant. I wish I knew exactly like how to find it immediately, but it's. The, I think you're talking about the Frank talk and the TEDx. No, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe. Oh, I'm really? Wrong. It's the one where you're doing stand up and then you ask people if they think they're funny. Yes, the Frank talk. Oh, yeah. Frank. Okay, that's the one. Um, tell us about that and like what you ask the audience and how, how you respond to that. Yes. And I can ask the folks in the chat today, raise your hand. If you've ever felt like you aren't funny, I think I'm you're funny. being complicit in white supremacy. 
don't do that. Don't do that. (laughs) And it, it's actually, um, a thought that sort of came to mind, uh, inspired by a joke of W. Kamau Bell's that was just like one of his, I think when he was touring around, um, performing around the Bay area, building his show, um, where he talked about, you know, there's so many beautiful people in the world in so many different ways of thinking about beauty. I'm Mm -hmm. entirely paraphrasing this. Um, and so of course there's so many standards of beauty and the way that we think of beauty is so rooted in a kind of in white supremacy and Mm -hmm. colorism. And that really got me thinking about laughter, mm, Same, thing. you know, cause he was like, of course there's everybody finds each other beautiful. And there's so many standards of beauty. There's not one empirical standard of beauty because so many people are having sex. And yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, so many people are it's laughing. Other too, yeah. <laughs> people are getting it on and people are laughing. There's so many folks yeah. cracking each other up all of the time. Why is it? And what happens that our um, sense of humor all of a sudden falls into this like formal framing of what's empirically funny right. and what's not that funny and who is really funny and who's just trying. Yeah. How does that happen? And why is it that whenever uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are innovating in the field of comedy, we're doing something different with the field? But yeah. when folks like Louis C.K. get up on stage, and tell meandering stories, then they're innovating the in the field. Right, right. What's going on with that? And why are we doing that? And what is that about, you know? Um, it's, it's like when I moved to America and I could not find SNL funny or Seinfeld funny. Like I just, no, it doesn't or doesn't work for me. Right. But, but you've talked about not just the way that comedians tell jokes, but the way the whole pipeline is set up too. And that's something you've been working to obliterate, maybe not obliterate, expand. <laughs> Blow up. Too many destructive words here. <laughs> like, yeah. Make it more expansive and inclusive. Yeah, what I found um, with my uh, report, popcollab.org slash funny is funny is where you can find it. Um, is that the pipeline to becoming a stand-up comedian is so heavily vetted based off of what is already accepted as stand-up, that Mm -hmm. it it just entirely prevents um, anybody outside of the heteronormative, cisgendered, white male experience from really innovating in the field at the base entry level. And so if you because it's all in bars and it's every night and it's very, very specific. Can you say more about that? Cause I think a lot of us don't, who aren't in comedy don't think about what you all are doing behind the scenes in order for us to go out on a Friday and watch one of your stand-up shows. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you started it there because I always forget to point out that a comedian is performing seven nights a week, three times a night. Right. If, if this is the career that you want to have, you want to be- Yeah. A touring comic. Like it's often, you know, and if you think about how often you sit down to write at your desk, right. If that was always with an audience of, you know, 20 something white guys all telling jokes about their dicks, your book would start to look really different. (laughs) Terrible. (laughs) It would be terrible. Yeah. Muslim woman at the bar telling dick jokes. I mean, <laughs> different sure title, probably. Probably, yeah. Yeah, probably. Now, now that you mention it, huh? huh. <laughs> but up. but you were saying it's this complete bar to stage pipeline kind of thing that at the expense of this other yes yeah way of joke telling and yeah comedy. And some of what I see happen is folks who are brilliant and funny like you that go, you know, oh, I want to explore comedy, then get put at the mouth of that scene. Yeah. As though you have to start brand new. Yeah. And this is your entire audience. And here you're coming in with a rich sense of audience and varied demographics that you've spoken to. And you've built all these instincts and all these skills. And to begin there makes folks who have done that and gone that route think my instincts must be wrong and I must not be made for comedy. 
I got really lucky though, in that I found, was found by this group that was merging science storytelling and comedy, right? I don't know if I told you about oh, this. Oh, that's so, brilliant. No, so tell the, us about that. Yeah, so the sets that I did and my last ever stand-up was on February 14th, 2020, right before lockdown. There was probably so much COVID circulating in that comedy wow. club in San Francisco. And it's funny because I had friends from the CDC who were in the Bay Area to investigate this new outbreak of viral pneumonia who came to my stand-up show. Oh gosh. Yeah. Anyway, so I haven't done anything on stage since then. Or no, no comedy since then. But the reason that worked so well for me, and I've done a couple of shows with that group, is because they were all about merging science storytelling with comedy. And so it was an entry point for me. And in fact, because of what I've been studying for over a decade, my whole set was about misinformation and disinformation and the crazy wild things that we humans believe that are not based in science at all because I grew up a conspiracy theorist right and I have family Same. members that want to get vaccinated and, and it completely makes sense uh, right okay. or I have family members that I cajoled into getting vaccinated who now 18 months later are like my knee hurts and it's because of that vaccine you made me get I'm like oh no that, that's not how it works but anyway so that was my whole setup, but you're so right. I, my life is not set up in a way where I am going to do three shows a night, 365 days a year, but even in taking your comedy class. And when you and I have talked after that, you're like, but that's kind of what you have to do if you're going to, and I'm like, well, I, I just, I'm not going to make it as a stand up comic and it's fine because that's not exactly what I'm trying to do, but I'm certainly trying to learn elements of that and borrow elements of that for the other things that I do. Well, that's something that um, folks at, folks watching at home, folks in the chat, that you can really be a part of changing. The more um, low stakes stage spaces we create, where we bring up folks um, to, you know, um, try a set, try some material, share a humorous story that they're workshopping, um, that they're in process with. Um, that is how we change, not just the field of comedy, I think, but our entire um, expanding sense of humor. It, and it's it, and it's just like for good storytelling foundation. Yes, well, I, I remember like starting off my my set and talking about my cousin Osama, and everyone started laughing. I was like, oh my gosh, that wasn't even the joke. <laughs> we haven't got to the joke yet. Um, so it was just really nice to have, in my case, an audience that loved stand up comedy but had bought a ticket that night because they also wanted a dose of science. Um, so I really hope that we see more like that. And what you're trying to do, which tell us about that kind of moving away from the bar pipeline? Yeah, I create um, workshops where at the end of the workshop after eight weeks, you get to put on a show. And a lot of folks in um, the Bay Area as well have workshops like that, Martha Reinberg. Um, I think for a while, Lisa Marie Rollins was also teaching and also does playwriting and just trying to create opportunities for us to have our expansive narratives that we then tighten down. I think a lot of times folks start tight and then try to just get tighter and tighter, but then you have to sort of give it room and breath to figure out what it is that you're actually saying before you really find it. Yeah. And I'm sure you found this as well, the more you perform and the more you talk about the same thing, the clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer you get on what it is you're trying to say about that thing. Yeah. And your if, class was a good way of narrowing into that kind of earlier in the process because of the way that you taught us over, was it eight weeks? I can't remember now, but if you can drop a link into the chat, um, at least here on the Zoom for people to sign up. Check it out company. at ZaraComedy.com. My best you know, student in the house. And it, it was really, you know, you, you asked about framing earlier on Zara and it was so important to me to have a section in this book that was called Muslim Women Laugh because I don't know if that's the side of us that others know like we are hilarious I mean not all of us but again not yeah. monolith right but some of us are hilarious and some of us have had really interesting journeys in terms of crafting careers as storytellers and comedians so you know you're there but there's other women from North Africa or France via North Africa from Southeast Asia um, and it was like I'm not just going to make this a book about our pain and our struggles because yeah that, that's <laughs> But it's going to be about our triumphs and about our screw ups and about us cracking each other up. Um, 
And I don't know how did, it's a funny thing actually, I don't know if I've ever done this, but how was it for you reading the part that I wrote about you? (laughs) Oh my goodness. I I mean, it was just, it was really exciting to see. And it was exciting, like, how to explain, you know, the, especially in comedy, your work is so isolating. It really Mm. is really lonely. And especially when you're working in a job and niche that already is really isolating and really lonely, you know, in the sense that it's just you, you know, out there on the stage, you don't get to share that always, you know, and sometimes you do. And sometimes it's just like on to the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one. And you don't know if you're making an impact and you don't really know what it is that you're doing. And you're like watching TV every day being like, I guess today's the day I quit maybe and save some money. (laughs) No, and then this life at all. Right. And it's just like so much hustle all the time. And then to hear from you and then to see the book and to see all of these women that I'm in the book with and to know that this book exists, you know, one day, inshallah, my children's 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 children will have this. Mm -hmm. It's just absolutely incredible. I just was so honored and so grateful and so proud of our community, of our colleagues, of the work that we do, of the ways that we create spaces for each other. It was so powerful. And it, I cried a lot of tears <laughs> of joy. Oh, oh thank, well, thank you for sharing that. And it was incredible to discover you because I didn't know you personally when I was writing about you. But then in the course of it, I sat next to you at a dinner in yeah. Oakland and was like, I wrote about you in my book. Um, which was a little thanks weird. to our friend Serena Lynn yeah love her um thank you Serena for the introduction and there was that whole drama about your dog and I was like wow who is this lady this is all like so weird my dog ruined Serena's screen so it's, now it's on tape oh, now it's on tape I, I can know. never go back oh, <laughs> oh, that rookie is the best um but yeah it's really there's a question in the Q&A about this as well in terms of like who to pick and did I pick And yeah, I did. And that's a beautiful thing about being an author is you do get to pick. Um, Although I'll tell you a funny, frustrating story is in that early stage in the, oh, we've seen this tweet go viral and we've seen your piece in the newspaper go viral. We want you to create a book. So Fahmida and I create a proposal, right? Which for nonfiction books, anyone that wants to write them, it's a table of contents, it's an outline, and it's just a couple of samples. You're not writing the whole thing. So we do this and we start to get this feedback from publishers that's like, wow, this is really cool. But like, maybe you could pick some people who are like more well-known. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know how I feel about that, but I'm kind of open to adding somebody who is a bit of a household name, maybe, I don't know, tell a bit of a different story of their life. So then we add them. And then it's like, then the feedback we get is like, oh, you put Malala Yousafzai in there. She's like so overexposed. And so like, you're right. So you can't win. And so I was like, screw this. Me and Fahmida are going to put in the people that we want to put in. And I think I actually ended up having more of a say just because of the terrible hierarchy in terms of authors and illustrators um but I was like no I want this woman in and I want this person in and so it was liberating to get to pick who goes in and of course I wanted volumes two three and four because there were so many amazing people that we just couldn't fit into one book but it was amazing coming across your story I watched a video you did for MTV where you talked about your brother's illness yes as a kid and I put that in there because to me that was Oof, it was a lot. It was sad and frustrating and scary, actually. Um, and then thinking about little baby Zara in the cereal aisle in the grocery store in California, being so little, but understanding what humor was doing in diffusing what could have been a terrifying situation in terms of a not so friendly person. Your mom, I think she was still wearing a headscarf at that time. Yes. Um, Yeah. And you and your mom potentially being cornered by somebody potentially scary. We were regularly cornered. Yeah. That was a period of time where people saw my mom's hijab and that meant hostage taker as Iranians um, during the Iranian revolution or even the years after the years that continued after. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And that was a moment where I first started to see um, the power of managing tension and using humor to diffuse tension Mm. um, because I really badly wanted Lucky Charms (laughs) and my mom wouldn't let me have it. (laughs) 
And this old Santa looking man came up to us and was like, why do you hate America? And I said, we don't hate America, sir. And would you tell the stupid immigrant that there's no pork in Lucky Charms? <laughs> My mom just doesn't get it. And, uh, you know, white, white supremacy teaching us to undermine our parents. <laughs> and he said, actually, there is. <gasps> I didn't know this part. Yeah, there's pork in Lucky it. Charms. Porky it's Lucky just- Charms. I'm not going to explain to folks how you're going to have to just Google it. You're going to have to just figure it out. I will say coming (laughs) from a family that is extremely ridiculously observant to their real sticklers. So there's always an argument in the family because somebody will say, I have a letter from Cadbury's, you know, the great chocolate maker. And the letter says, and everyone's like, why did you write to Cadbury's again? Oh, no. And they'll be like, no, no, it just says that this one chocolate that's your favorite oh, and your favorite, worst. yeah, it's made in a, in a factory where there's alcohol. And it was like, oh, <laughs> at one point, Colgate toothpaste was apparently haram. Like it gets very, very comical. Or like when you open a bag of potato chips, as you call it, we call it crisps. There's the, you know, you get that hit with that smell and apparently some alcohol is used to kind of like push those. Oh, you're t- ruining moments. everyone's lives right now. Yeah, you're just I'm- like it all out. <laughs> we banned right. from library talks forever, but. Before um, we get banned from the Reddit threads. I think Colgate is so, fine. I think Colgate is halal now. We, they've, they've made changes, folks. Don't be scared. This we've got a, a couple of, uh, we've got comments, but we also have some Q&A that I want to pivot to. Okay, here we go. We've got Zara. Have you ever listened to the podcast Radio Humra? Uh, I would be curious to hear your perspective. I have not. I will check it out and I will get back to you. What else do we have here? Uh, we've got. We don't uh, have to do all the Q and A. We don't have to. Scrolling do through, we've got a lot of questions. We have a question about your research process for the book. Okay. Um, my research process was actually really fun because I was going through some things in life at the time that I was writing this book. So actually digging into stories about really inspiring women was very, um, strengthening and inspiring. And, you know, like you mix the joy and the pain with the humor, with the resilience and just with the FUs. Um, one of my favorite pieces of research, I was writing about these, um, women races in Palestine. Uh, speed sisters uh, which you can read about in the book but there's this amazing documentary that's made about them so my research process was really varied depending on who I was writing about because Muslim women are everything includes modern day women but also historical figures that was tricky because they were historical figures who happened to be women and therefore not that much was written about them you know they were kind of referenced as oh the 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 wife of so-and-so right she is the wife of so-and-so also happened to have founded this one mathematical equation that like solved all the problems of the time, but she was so-and-so's husband and that's how she was known. So accessing archival material and actually getting some of the juice that we wanted was a little tricky at times. Less difficult with modern women, but again, there were like difficult editorial decisions to make. Like there are so many amazing Muslim women comics. How do we pick the few that we're gonna introduce our readers to? So, yeah. Yeah. How did you figure out how to kind of narrow down? Like what was your sort of scientific method in that? Like um, just that curation process. I had a spreadsheet Uh uh, because I have a spreadsheet for everything in life. Um, because thank I God saw, for spreadsheets. I mean, seriously, like, and I was saying it to a friend, kind of like berating myself at the time, like having to do it that way. And he was like, But how else would you make sure you've got everyone you want? And I was like, Yeah, you're right. Like, there isn't another <laughs> it. because it was really important to me that I wanted disabled women in there and I wanted mm. dark skinned women, you know, like so much of the conference. Like, I get invited to panels all the time as a journalist who's who is Muslim, and I have to check before I join these panels at these conferences, like, is anyone mm. other than like Middle Eastern? And South Asian Muslims are going to be on the panel because, like, you know, more right. than a third of Muslims in America are black. And why are we not including all kinds of Muslims in the conversation? So I did not want to create a book that just kind of continued the erasure of certain kinds of Muslims. Um, so I had a spreadsheet. That was my scientific process. And in your geographically representative too. Yeah. Right. Like a lot of people forget this. Like we talk all the time about, you know, Islam as a you know, breaking the monolith. But then 
there is also real work that we individually have to do to make sure that that representation is yeah. happening. And it, it can be tough when you're already part of a disenfranchised group to then also within that realize some of the privileges that we yeah. have. Yeah. And yeah, but we have to like, don't go, don't, I've learned my lesson. Like don't be on a panel unless you've done your due diligence about who else is on that panel. Uh, oof, I learned the hard way with that, but you know, you learn, you learn to ask questions and you also learn to say, thanks for thinking of me, but no, like you need some different people on your panel, not me this time. Um, but yeah, we kind of, it just has to be done. Otherwise we're missing out like half the conversation and half the perspective. Yeah. So, so much of that, um, learning came for me from being a part of um, writers collectives like Vona's, um, mm -hmm. not just its retreats, but the communities, you know, that come out of the Vona voices, um, right. community. Um, yeah. yeah. Where, where did you find your community support to, you know, for that kind of vetting and for those kinds of strategies? Cause it's the, if you're new to that, if you're new to it, you know, and you're working within pipelines, just thinking about your ascension, I think it can be really challenging to find, you yeah. know, that methodology. For me, it actually wasn't in any Muslim spaces. It was among friends and community who were doing anti-racism work. So I think almost like by osmosis, I picked up some of the ways that they were addressing these issues and was like, oh yeah, I can apply that to book writing or I can apply that to public platforms that I have or conferences I'm asked to speak at. So, I mean, it's not that complicated in a way especially if you're the one that holds more of the privilege. And again, you're right. When you're part of a marginalized group, it can be really easy. And I've had so many frustrating conversations. People are like, but I'm a Muslim and I suffer Islamophobia. And it's like, yeah, but there are these intersecting identities we hold. Like I'm able-bodied, right? Um, and so I need, I need to think about how, how much I miss out on, a, on perspectives from disabled colleagues and disabled advocates, for example. So, yeah. Nice. Thank you, folks, for all of these fantastic questions. We've got time for two more, I think. Let's see what we have. Oh, can I ask you a question, Zara? So, you know, you're working on the post production phase of your comedy special. Where and when will we see it? So, it's in the process of getting edited down. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, the where we're shopping it. Okay. Uh, and we're, we're looking for producing partners. So if you're out there and you've got connections to that, please reach out to me. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm putting on um, a series of shows with Stageworks Theater um, on Valencia in San Francisco. There'll be a Zoom component and there'll be a live show component in person. <gasps> I don't want to jinx it. Knock on <laughs> all the things um, that, that folks can check out um yeah yeah uh the, man it's like doing comedy right now it's so difficult I can't stress mm -hmm. how like how much of a support it is to have room and stage space in various other programs to do a little bit of comedy you know um and so I just want to one more time plug like if you have an event and you have room for a five minute set by a comedian that you can invite do, do, you know, so there's, I've seen so many people take the time to put together shows and then a surge happens and they have to cancel the whole thing, Oh wow! you know, oh. and it's, it's incredibly challenging in this time, especially because you gear up with promo, you gear up, you gear up, yeah. you know? And so I've been really encouraging folks to do a hybrid where you have like the live stage version and you also have the zoom so that if you don't right. have the live stage version, then you can, you know, use the zoom version as well. And I'm always falling back on my old UC Berkeley theater roots for strategies. And with um, with the comedy special from the outside looking in, I think many of us would assume that the dream, the hope is that you land a Netflix special, right? That your special lands somewhere yeah. like that. Is, is that accurate or are there other like actually more meaningful ways for you to be? Accurate? I mean, of course, yeah. Why that's, you know, the bee's knees, but nobody gets that, you know, I mean, everybody who has a Netflix special first pitched it to a smaller production company that then brought it to a production company like comedy dynamics, um, that, and you know, there's 800 pound gorilla. There's also blonde medicine does comedy albums out of the Bay area. Um, there's so many production houses 
that all sort of get funneled in. And even something that a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the specials that we saw on Netflix were first produced by Comedy Central and then Netflix oh, purchased them. Awesome. So, you know, sometimes you're watching a comedy show that you saw actually taped in 2017, you know, that then came out in 2019 or oh, later. Yeah. When you start learning how these industries work, like the mechanics of it is always so interesting we have like three minutes left and I wonder if we can do that annoying thing that always happens to us at parties for me I get cornered and asked medical advice you I'm hoping get cornered and uh, asked like tell me a joke make me laugh so I wondered if we could just do that to each other you ask me a question then I ask you to make us laugh okay let's do it and uh I'll yeah okay I have and I, I have mine here we go okay what's your question for me my question for you is to take us back to my first promise that I was going to break it out then into the universe. Oh, oh, okay. And ask you when you're sitting in your moments of pandemic existential crisis, uh -huh. what is your go-to self-care? Oh, I thought you were going to ask about like your knee pain or your shoulder or something. Um, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. My self-care nowadays it's changed over the last two years because I have changed. Um, but it's been two things recently, weightlifting and then oh, nice. picking up the phone and cold calling friends without texting first to see if they're free and just having an impromptu, like super old school style conversation. Yeah, That's a conversation that, that, with friends. That might not sound radical to people, but I'm not a big phone talker and I have become more so recently. Yeah. Oh, mine. I feel like I am not being true to my extrovert self in my self care. Oh, maybe you need to fix that. Okay, but now make us laugh. 60 seconds. Um, my self-care has been the X-Files. Oh, wait, no, you have to tell us a joke. I love the X-Files. That was the joke. That was the joke. <laughs> that was it. That was the joke, folks. I, I, I get it. It is cool to do that to you. Um, but have you, have you not got like even like a knock-knock who's there? What kind of comedian are you, Zara? What have I done? <laughs> what have I done isn't your Netflix special going to be a series of knock knock jokes I'm, I'm laughing I'm laughing <laughs> it's working it's working it's going to be me as Mulder telling knock knock jokes okay yeah I'm down for it the fungus episode okay. is my favorite by the way oh it's so good I was going to ask you if you had a favorite oh hell yes I'm, I'm an X-Files fan how about you, Anissa? Absolutely. It's been a while. I did not watch the new one. Not a new X-Files. Oh, the new one was Islamic phobic as heck. The first one was like all in a mosque in Texas and weird. But go back to the 90s and the fungus episode is hands down the best X-Files episode. I'm looking for something good to watch. So I will do that. And as I promised, these two brought the links, brought the resources. So please, you can check that all out in this one handy dandy link. And... Seema and Zara, oh my gosh, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. Oh, fire and no pressure, Zara, but remember there is another comedian out there whose name begins with a Z who is saving his country right now. I don't know what I'm going to do. I've, yeah. I've got work to do. Mm -hmm. Got to make my oh, parents I'm proud. Thank All right, for having us. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank sign up for the class. Yes. Definitely sign up for the class. Bye-bye. Bye. Get the book. And get the book. <laughs> get the book. <laughs> Muslim women are everything by Dr. Sima Yasmin and Famida Azim. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you to the SF Public Library. Thank okay. you. Thank you to libraries yeah. everywhere.